Thank you, Lord, that you're ruling and reigning. Help us now, Lord, to listen to your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, well, I don't know if you've seen that program, The Big Bang Theory. I hope you managed to see that video. It was pretty dark, wasn't it? Um, it's a show about four intelligent friends or geeks, if we're allowed to say that. And the main character there that you saw sitting on the bench is a guy called Sheldon Cooper. And he's a very intelligent guy and he knows it. Although a comedy show, there's a lot of reality, isn't there, in that clip? There's Sheldon Cooper who thinks he's a cut above the rest. He's very sure about himself and praises his achievements. And he's judgmental, isn't he, to the other guy on the bench. He thinks of himself as superior and sophisticated, where he sees the other guy as rather average and not, uh, doesn't have much to contribute. But as he points out, there is a great equaliser, isn't there, between him and and the man, and in this case it's the rain. You see, the person who Sheldon thinks is the loser in life actually becomes the winner when he puts his umbrella up. Sheldon gets a dose of humble pie. In today's parable by Jesus, we're going to meet two people. One who believes himself to be a bit special, someone who doesn't think he needs anything. Someone who thinks that they have it all sorted and they, they believe that they don't need to be given anything, let alone show mercy. We're also going to meet someone who knows they're not good enough and they know that they need a second chance. But the equaliser in our story today is not the rain, it's the living God. The living God who shows mercy to all those who know that they need it. Um, so we're going to move through this story in two points. Uh, the first point is two men with two prayers, and that's verses 9 to 13. And then we're going to see the last verse, which is two results in verse 14. So two men with two prayers. Uh, Jesus tells this parable, doesn't he? And the men are starkly different. They're like chalk and cheese. They're like Liverpool and Man United. They're like a night at the opera or a club night in Ibiza, none of which I've gone to, but I imagine they're fun. <laughs> Jesus picks two people at the opposite end of the spectrum. One would have been viewed as having it sorted. The other would have been not even worth acknowledging on the street. One would have, had, uh, would have been in the broadsheets having respectable stories written about him. The other blasted over the tabloids as lower than the gutter. Two men going to the same place, doing the same thing, but two very different men. Two men going to the temple to pray, but having different views of themselves. Um, I've got a bit of a confession to make, and uh, Mark isn't here, uh, now he's in junior church, but um, when me and Mark lived together, we would tell uh, endless stories about the effect that this had had on our childhood. There we go, WWF. It's now called WWE. Um, it's probably a bit weird enjoying men oiled up, pretending that they're fighting, but anyway, we can go into that later. Um, but what WWF does is it's really good at building up the event, really good at building up the uh, fake fights that they're going to have. And so the ring announcer would say something like, coming down to the ring weighing 260 pounds from California, the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, The Rock. And The Rock would come out and he'd have his theme music blaring. Uh, he'd come, you know, walk kind of quite cockily to the ring. Um, and you'd see that the ring announcer would tell you some basic information about that wrestler. Um, you'd get like a, a snapshot into what they're like. Um, well, here Jesus describes some basic information but key information about the two men. We don't know their age, we don't know their address, we don't know if they like the opera or Ibiza, but we get enough information to draw out what these two are like. Um, so we've got the Pharisee. Yeah. And we've got the tax collector here. And they've got two... There's two... Um, there's different things, isn't there, 
between these two men. So first of all, the tax collector, he would have been looked up to in society. He'd have been looked up to in society. The Pharisee would have been the one who was viewed as good in society, the one who was a role model to those around him, the one who took God's law seriously. Uh, think about the people in society now who are commendable, uh, judges or maybe a vicar, who you could expect a high standard of to deliver. And the tax collector, by contrast, he would have been an outsider and hated. Now, uh, we need to get the kind of view of what this tax collector was like. This wasn't like an HMRC government official who kind of deducts uh, wages off your pay slip if you get one of them. No, in the days we're talking about, this tax collector would have been seen as a collaborator. You see, the Romans were in power, and rather than use their own resources uh, to kind of collect money from the areas that they conquered, they used people who were living and existing in them areas to do the tax collecting. It would be a lot more efficient for them. Um, so the tax collectors as well could keep any extra money for themselves. So there they were, squeezing and extorting people who they'd probably grown up with who were in their community. They were seen as lower than the low. Um, if you've seen any of them war films, um, you sometimes see women, don't you, um, with the shaved heads who maybe had collaborated with the Nazis and had a relationship maybe with, you know, like a, an officer. Um, they were viewed, weren't they, as traitors to their own nation, as collaborating with the, uh, the occupying forces. And you can see the posture as well, can't you, of the two men is different. So the Pharisee, he looked down on everybody else. So he looked down on everybody else. Uh, verse 11 says this, the Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. <clears throat> you see, I think it's fair to say, isn't it, that the Pharisee uh, was confident in his own righteousness. You can kind of picture him, can't you, swanning in to the temple, feeling very self-satisfied with himself. And he stands up to pray, doesn't he? He would have been the one who's been all to all the Christian conferences, the one who never misses a quiet time. He would have been confident, wouldn't he, that he was good enough, that his own efforts were good enough for God. But the tax collector, again, stood at a distance. So the tax collector stood at a distance. Verse 13 says this, the tax collector stood at a distance he would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast. The Pharisee is confident and believes himself to be in the right place at the temple. The same cannot be said about the tax collector. He knew something was wrong. He counts himself as unworthy. He doesn't even look up to heaven, but he beats his breast. He knows that the temple has a reputation that doesn't accept people like him. He knows that the temple was holy and he was a rotten sinner. And let's uh, look at how the men pray. So the Pharisee <laughs> prays about himself. Uh, verses 11 to 12. God, I thank you that I'm not like the other men. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. The Pharisee starts, doesn't he, by saying what he isn't. And in some senses, he's right, isn't he? It's good to thank God that we haven't gone completely off the rails, uh, that we're sitting here this morning. But we know, don't we, that the Pharisee is praying and playing comparisons. I'm not like the others. I'm a cut above the rest, don't you know? I'm not bad. I'm not robbing people. I'm not doing evil. I don't cheat on my wife and sleep around. And I'm certainly not like this tax collector who exploits his own people. And then he goes on to pray, doesn't he, about what he does do. He fasts twice a week. He gives away a tenth of all he gets. He prays to himself and about himself. There isn't any worship of God here, is there? Think of all the Psalms uh, which praise the wonder and glory of God. 
The Pharisee is looking horizontally, isn't he, when he should be looking vertically. The one who we think has got it all sorted is actually missing the point. And in contrast, we see the tax collector. He prayed to God, he knew he was a sinner, and asked for mercy. It's a simple prayer, isn't it? And it's from a place where he knows he needs help. He prays to God, verse 13, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The tax collector knew his position before God. He knew that he needed help and he went to the helper. He knew that with God, there was no pulling his, uh, the wool over God's eyes. He knew that he knew that he was a sinner and needed rescue. Um, well, I'm going to tick off one of my uh, dean likes to tick off uh, things that I do in the sermons. One one of the things I do is talk about TV shows. So here's another one. You would have heard me talk about this uh, previously. It's called The Wire. Again, if you're a kid, don't watch this. Um, don't watch it with your grandma and granddad and all that. Um, it's a very gritty TV show, and it's about um, rival drug gang gangs in Baltimore and they basically compete for territory and it's about how the police department put in uh, plans to deal with this. Um, but what I find interesting, even in this show, uh, where there's these kind of brutal gangs, is that it's full of mini Pharisees. In one episode, two gangs have a fight and on one occasion, a kid gets caught in the crossfire and dies. The unthinkable happens. It's shocking. And it depicts what an awful tragedy it is when kids get in the crossfire of selfish, selfish decisions. But it's amazing how uh, one of the gang leaders uh, called Stringer Bell, which is played by Idris Elba, uh, looks down on the other gang and is calling for the blood of the person who made the mistake and accidentally shot the kid. This character, Stringer Bell, is the same gang leader who orders the murders of people without blinking and ruins communities by selling drugs. The same guy who orders violence to addicts when they don't, don't pay. It's amazing how suddenly he becomes a righteous judge. The gangs in this programme have got their own measuring stick or own uh, pedometer that we saw in that video. They have a belief system. Murder to other adults and drug trafficking is fine, but anything worse and you're out. Comparison games are even being played in this TV show. Now I've used an extreme example, haven't I, to illustrate that, but Jesus' parable hits home, doesn't it? If you're anything like me, you're more than the Pharisee than we care to admit. Uh, this is some of the ways that I've been acting as a mini-Pharisee this week. Lord, I thank you that I'm trying to bring up my kids the best I can without them swearing and being horrible. Lord, I'm a great carer and I don't need your help to bring them up well. Lord, I thank you that I'm not like that them people at work who gossip about others. I mean, I do speak negatively about people, but that's just because of their poor performance. It's so easy, isn't it, just to self-justify, to pray about ourselves rather than about God. We can fall into ridiculous Pharisee traps. How quick we forget the mercy of God and the fact that he's had grace in our lives. As I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. You see, if you view yourself as either the Pharisee, you think you're doing pretty well, or the tax collector, you think you're doing pretty badly, both need the mercy of God, don't they? Both need to go to God and repent. What are the telltale signs in our church that we might become Pharisees? Well, we have to think about the limits of people who we think God maybe can't save. Maybe people on the estate who are drug addicts or the sex offender. See, we can be encouraged. I think in this church, 
we do a really good job of welcoming everyone who comes through them doors. But we need to pray, don't we, that we keep doing that, and we need to pray that Christ would save those who we think are beyond mercy. What about the way you view other members of the church? When you see them step out in faith and serve, do you look at the negative aspects of their life rather than praising God for the fact that he is at work in them? If you've come this morning as a Pharisee, why not come to God and repent? The Lord is merciful to all those who call on him, both Pharisee and tax collector. And what if you've come to church today feeling a little bit more like the tax collector, feeling a little bit unworthy? Well, in some ways, it's right, isn't it, to feel that way, because uh, that's what we are. We are unworthy to come to God. But we shouldn't leave ourselves there, should we? God loves you so much that he sent his own son to bleed and die in your place. We don't have to stand at a distance. We can come confidently to him knowing the performance of Jesus hit that measuring stick. Whatever you've done this week, whatever barrier or hurdle that stops you coming to God, rejoice today that you are forgiven by the only true God who is gracious and merciful. He accepts, accepts you not on what, you, on what you've done, but what, on he, what he has done. Um, well, let's uh, move on to the second point, two results. And uh, we see the outcome, don't we, in verse 14. Uh, I tell you, that, tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. <coughs> so we've got our two results here. Oh, thanks. So we've got our two results here. Don't worry if you don't uh, can't see that, I'll, I'll tell you. So the Pharisee, his result, well, he exalted himself, didn't he? And he left the temple unjustified. The Pharisee humbled himself, so was justified. The two results. And I think uh, the outcome here given by Jesus is not just for these two men, but it's for every human being that has lived or is living or will live on planet Earth. There's no exceptions to do with weight or height or race or family background or how much money you have in the bank or whether, in inverted commas, you've made a success of your life. Not even if you've over to leave or remain. The two outcomes are either to be humbled or to be exalted. To either be justified, made right with God, or to stay at odds with God. What is Jesus meaning about humbling ourselves? It's a phrase, isn't it, that has appeared a couple of other places in Scripture. So Jesus in Luke 14, uh, on another occasion with a Pharisee, uses this phrase. Um, also in Matthew 23, Jesus uses this phrase when he's talking about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Um, and immediately after this passage, in verse 17, he talks about humbling yourself as he says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God, like a little child, will not enter it. So what are we to make of these sayings and stories that Jesus tells? Well, I think the main question that we can have from this is where do we put our dependence? Jesus is very clear in the Bible that any persistent de dependence on ourselves or persistent talking up of ourselves in this life will mean a humbling in the future. But if we're like little children, or like the tax collector who know they need mercy from God, that humility means that future exaltation will be the result. Now being humble is not going around saying, I'm rubbish at this, or I'm terrible at that. So imagine if Andy came up to me today and he said, do you know what, Nathan? I'm feeling really humble today. I'm going to let you play the guitar in front of church and sing. That would be a disaster, wouldn't it? Or uh, Matty, um, you know, said, I feel really humble. 
uh, Nate, you go and do my garden. Uh, you know, it would, again, disaster, wouldn't it? <laughs> do you know what I mean? So it, it's not a case of going around saying that we're rubbish at stuff. What it is saying is that constantly you say, Lord, I need mercy and forgiveness in every area of my life. I'm not going to conduct my life in the way that I think. I'm going to conduct it by your scripture. It's not like um, using our own measuring sticks, is it? It's using the measuring stick of the Bible, which we can never live up to anyway. And it's depending on the fact that Jesus has already hit that benchmark for us at the cross. An exaltation, well, Jesus uses the example of the Pharisee to show what exaltation looks like in this life. It's a self-justifying reliance. The Pharisee edges out Jesus by comparing himself with others. Um, me and Kaylee and the family went to uh, TGI Fridays on Monday. It was an awful experience. Um, no offence if you've been there and you uh, enjoy it. But we were there for two hours, the food was cold, totally rubbish. And it's easy how when things don't go your way, you start acting uh, in a very self-justified way. So, you know, you'll look at the waiters who aren't putting the food on your table, start feeling really negatively to them. You'll start moaning about how much money it is. Your own family will start doing, doing your head in. It's easy, isn't it, to get to that point where we just want things our way. We want to self-justify ourselves and we put things, um, you know, we put people into our own character. Uh, like categories. It's like if you've ever been to an airport and you know your flight's delayed, every little thing gets a little bit more kind of rushed up, doesn't it? So you look down on the lads who are there on a boozy holiday, you look at that family who can't control their kids. It doesn't take long, does it, for the mini Pharisee to kick in and for us to put ourselves above everyone else. The Pharisee looks like the real deal, doesn't he? He relies on his own goodness. But the Pharisee may be standing here at the temple, but when he stands before the living God, he will be humbled. His own goodness gets nowhere near the living God and his perfection. Whereas the tax collector, he's on enough, honest enough to say, isn't he, that he needs help, and that means he goes home justified. This is the upside-down kingdom of Jesus at work. The one we think that is is out by his sin, is actually in because of his repentance. And who was the ultimate example of humility before exaltation? Well, it's Jesus, isn't it? The one who had every right to humble himself, uh, every right to exalt himself when he was on earth. The one who was without sin, who became sin for us at the cross. He chose the most humbling experience, his own death. He prayed in the garden in anguish, Father, not my will, but yours. He was despised and beaten. He was mocked and had nails driven into him. A crown of thorns was placed on his head. But he knew it was God's plan and he was dependent on him. This is what Philippians 2 says. Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus was humbled and then exalted. If we go the way of the cross in this life, in the future, we will be with Jesus in heaven. It's not something that we can earn or deserve but it's the reality of every Christian sitting here today. And that truth will shape how you live your life day to day. Going to the cross means we don't have to stand at a distance. As Jesus was on the cross, the temple curtain was ripped in two. 
access to God was made a possibility, not by anything that we've done, but purely because God acted on our behalf. So if you've come to church this morning feeling weighed down like the tax collector, I'd say again, go to the cross and receive mercy. At the cross, Jesus took all sin and he died for all those who, knew, who know they need rescue. Those who humble themselves at the cross will be exalted. Uh, now, I wonder if you remember a few years ago that Muhammad Ali died. Um, he was not just big in his sport, was he? But he was big in the world. Uh, there were tributes from all over uh, when he died, stating what a good person he was. And he did a lot of good things, didn't he? Um, you could say he was one of life's all-rounders. He was great in the boxing ring. He stood up for the government when he didn't agree with going to war, um, to the point where he is actually banned from boxing. Uh, on all accounts, he was charming to everyone he met. He did lots of charity work. It's hard to criticise someone like that, isn't it? And we should give thanks to God for the way in which he gives common grace to people. But as far as we know, Muhammad Ali never went the way of the cross, did he? He was the man who had exalted himself in this life and was the self-professed the greatest. But Muhammad Ali, he's just like you and me, isn't he? He would have had to stand before God and give an account on what he made, as Jesus, made of Jesus. It's a sobering example, isn't it, that those who exalt themselves now will be humbled in the future. Dependence on God now means blessing in the future with a place in heaven with him. Rejection of him now means a humbling in the future and a place in hell, an eternity without him. The stakes really are that high. Now, I doubt that anyone in this room will ever reach the stardom or fame of Muhammad Ali. Joel is a pretty good fighter, so we can see how that one plays out. Um, but in all seriousness, again, I've used an extreme example, but I want to ask, ask you today, have you gone to God with humility and dependence? Do you know that you need him not just for eternity, but for this life as well? The Pharisee thought that he was doing okay, that he would be all right with God. He was saying, wasn't he, I'm not like those really bad people, the robbers, the evildoers. And we can substitute um, the Pharisee for us, can't we? We can say, oh, well, you know, I'm not like them mums at the school gate who gossip. I'm not like them men who just get plastered over the weekend and don't really care about their family. We can justify ourselves all the time, can't we? And we can substitute that uh, being justified in any, any way, can't we? Maybe it's your job that gives you your justification. That extra bit of work during the week, with that extra bit of money, which means you have no time for Jesus. The workplace can be a difficult place, can't it? Where, just, you know, where we can justify ourselves on a daily basis. It's full of selfish ambition that sometimes we try and join in with. We need to pray, don't we, that we would be so secure in God's justification that we don't look for it in our work. Teenagers, there's this thing called Instagram, isn't there? I've been on it once. Don't like it. Boring. Gave it up. Okay? It's really easy, easy, isn't it, to get your justification from how many double taps you get on your pictures, if that's still a thing, to put your hope in them. Can I say that the justification you get from Jesus is so much better than what you'll get from Instagram. Instagram, it's there and then it's gone, isn't it? Jesus gives you lasting justification, love and mercy in your life. He treats you with dignity and respect, so much so that he died to save you. So as I finish, whether you identify with the Pharisee or the tax collector this morning, and you might identify as the Pharisee in one situation and the tax collector in another. I want to urge you to come to the cross again. I want to, I want to pray that you would admit your sin and know the power of being justified by Jesus. 
My prayer is that every day, in any situation that you're in, you constantly cry out for God's mercy, knowing that you're not good enough and that you need Jesus in your life. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we have peace with you because of what you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, that you had every right uh, to sweep us, Lord, off the earth. But thank you that you've had mercy on us. We thank you, Lord, that you led us to the cross. We thank you, Lord, that we're justified by faith. We thank you, Lord, that you've reserved a place for us in heaven. And we pray, Lord, that we'd live that out uh, in reality day by day. I pray that you'd help us with our brothers and sisters to love each other well, to not look down or think we're superior. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you've blessed this church over the years with um, a humble love, and we pray, Lord, that that will grow. In your name, amen. And um, we're going to sing a last song, um, which I think is...